I want to thank the Lord for the board of the church. It's pastor. So I know officially it's like pastor appreciation month, but the board has made it staff appreciation month because there's like 18 or 19 or 20. I don't know what it is that are on the staff and the board has, um, they are passing out to the staff appreciation gifts. So we appreciate that to the elders and to the church for your appreciation of our ministry. All right, got your Bibles? First Samuel, we're going through the book of First Samuel, and um, I believe we're in chapter 22. So let me make sure here. Yes. Let me grab my spear. I might use that. Don't get me mad today when I have my spear. All right. So the title of my sermon is Every Man Needs a Man Cave. And I'll discuss more of that in a moment. You remember last week I told you, I, maybe I didn't mention, did I mention in this service that I had a joke, but I didn't have time to do it? No. I did in the other two services. Do you, do you want the joke from last week that I couldn't do, or should we just move on? Is it funny? Look, <laughs> I don't know if it's funny or not. Um, I did it to my grandchildren, and they thought it was hilarious. But, you know giving it to children and giving it to mature adults is two different stories, I guess. All right, so you remember last week I had a sermon about the dog, Doag. Do you remember him? He's, yeah, he chose evil. There are some people who just choose to do wrong and evil, and he kills all of the priests except for one and the whole town of Nob. And so I had a sermon on the dog, but I had a joke about a dog. So this, this little dog, very smart, as you can see in the picture. And somehow he finds himself in the jungles of Africa. And out of the corner of his eye, he sees a leopard. Oh, by the way, there's a nosy, no good monkey up in the tree watching all of this. Out of the corner of his eye, the dog sees a leopard coming closer. And so the smart dog runs over to a big pile of bones, grabs a bone, and pretends he's just finishing off a meal. And as the leopard got close, the smart dog went, my, that was the most delicious leopard I ever ate. The leopard heard, and, and you know, hair went up, scared, and ran off. The monkey up in the tree that watched this whole thing said, what, what is wrong with that leopard? You know, that crazy leopard. So the, the monkey is swinging through the trees, chasing after the leopard. And after about a half hour, finally catches up to the leopard and says, what is wrong with you? How stupid can you be? Do you think that little dog ate a whole leopard? Look how small he is. You know, you, and, the, and the leopard said, yeah, you're right. I'm going to go back and eat that dog. And the monkey says, get on my back, monkey. And so the leopard heads back. Well, now the little smart dog, he sees the leopard and the monkey heading back, and he's got to think quick. And so the, the little dog starts pacing back and forth, very annoyed, very annoyed. And just as the leopard comes, that little dog goes, where's that monkey that I sent out a half an hour ago to get me another leopard to eat? I thought it was funny. Yeah. <laughs> My grandchildren said, well, what happened to the monkey? And I went, he became a monkey sandwich for the leopard. And they were like, what? <laughs> so, all right. That's it for humor. For this, well, yeah. So every man needs a man cave. And I was thinking something humorous about this. So this is men, when we get into our man cave. It's one of the advantages when you get older. 
when you get older and experience the empty nest. This is so good. For those of you that have kids, let me share with you something you have to look forward to. As each kid leaves, my wife and I will take turns claiming new man caves and woman caves. So one kid moves, my wife goes, that's now my sewing room cave. The next kid move, I go, that's now my library cave. The next kid moves out. It's nice when you have a big house. So Rob and I have divvied up the house. I have like five caves, and she's got about five caves in the house. So it's, it's kind of neat. So a man cave is a male retreat, a sanctuary in a home, such as a specially equipped garage, spare bedroom, media room, den, basement, or tree house. I don't have the tree house yet. The man cave is an area where a man can do as he pleases in a masculine space. In 2005, Paula Amir of Tuff University suggested it was the last bastion. Is that how you say that? Bastion of masculinity. Wow. According to psychiatrist and author Scott Holtzman, it is important for a man to have a place to call his own a man cave. So you see how important this is. And I want to read to you the story of a man cave. So 1 Samuel 22. King David, or no, he's not King David. He's just David at this point. He's probably in his 20s. Because he's, he's been married to Saul's daughter. Um, so we'll put him in his 20s. And so in chapter 22, verse 1, David left Gath. That's, he's fleeing from King Saul, who is out to kill him. He escaped to the cave of Adullam. This is his man cave. When his brother's and his father's household heard about it, they went down to him there. And by the way, it's, it's either called his, man ca his cave or his fortress. They can be used interchangeably for this cave of Adullam. Verse 2, all those who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him, and he became their commander. About 400 men were with him. And by the way, these caves are very big, and the men would also have their wives and children. Verse 3, from there David went to Mitzpah and Moab and said to the king of Moab, would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? So he left them with the king, and he goes back to his man cave, and they stayed with him as long as David was in the stronghold, as long as he was in that cave. But the prophet Gad said to David, do not stay in the stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of Hereth. So the cave of Dulam, it's, it's located about 17 miles south of Jerusalem. Um, so David flees there to hide. It's his man cave to hide from King Saul and his army that's out to get him. Adullam means a place of refuge. So... We don't know how that cave got that name, but it was a place of refuge and security for David. Now, believe it or not, you know David loves to sing, and he likes writing songs about different events in his life. Um, and we looked at one of those songs that he sang about the dog last week. But this morning, let's look, about, let's look at his song about his man cave. So come with me to Psalm 142 in your Bible. And we will look at the song he sang in his man cave. Psalm 142. Keep, keep your ribbon you know, that ribbon that they give you in your Bible, keep that in 1 Samuel 22 or your bulletin or something. Psalm 142, everyone there? 
you'll notice a little heading that's in the original. That's not added in by the Bible translators. That's in the original Hebrew. It says, a mascal of David, it's a musical term, when he was what? In the cave. Here's his prayer. I cry out loud, aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him I tell my trouble. So David is crying out to God in his man cave. And he's crying. You can imagine what David is saying to God. God, I lost my wife. I lost my job. I lost my home. I lost my financial security. I lost my friends. I lost my prestige. I have lost God. Everything has been taken from me. Verse 3, when my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. He's talking about King Saul setting up traps to try to catch him. Verse 4, look and see. There is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. Boy, that talk about depression. When you're depressed, it's like I'm all alone. I have no one, no one who really cares for me. No one who's, you know, I can call out to, talk to. I have, I have no one in this cave. I have no refuge, he says. No one cares for my life. Verse 5, I cry to you, Lord. But then I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. And I think when we go through depression, I know I have, and, and when we get into our man cave, our female caves, you know, I think we have to come to a point where we just cry out to God and God becomes our refuge. Verse 6, listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. That's King Saul coming after him with the whole army. Verse 7, set me free from my prison. The cave is like a prison. He's trapped in that cave. He's all alone. And it's like a prison because he knows if he goes out, the enemy will find him and kill him. So he's praying to God, set me free from my prison that I may, what? Give thanks or praise your name. So I want you to remember that, to praise. He wants to be set free from the prison that he would praise the name. And then he says, then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. Do you see that? It's, it's very interesting. He's all alone. He's praying to God. I'm all alone. I'm by myself. No one cares for me. No. One. And then it's like God says, you need to trust in me completely. You need to make me your refuge, your all in all. And David when David says, you know, save me from my prison, I want to praise your name. And then when David gets that right, and I'm telling you, every one of us gets challenged in this. When David gets that right, then he says that the righteous, other believers, will gather about him. So let's come back now to 2 Samuel 22. Because that's exactly what happens. 2 Samuel 22, he escapes, he goes to the cave of Adullam. He's all by himself. He's depressed. He's complaining to God. He's, uh, I'm all alone. But then he comes to a point, and I have no idea if it's days, weeks, or months. He cries out and finally says, God, you're my refuge. I put my hope in totally in you, and, and I just, I submit myself to you, Lord. And then, who are the first people that come to him? His brothers. Remember, David was the youngest. How many older brothers does he have? 
seven. I just think to myself, David must have already, the anointing must have been so strong on him that his seven older brothers said, we're coming to our younger brother's help. We're coming by his side. We're going to be there with him. And then who comes next? His brothers come. Then who else comes to David? Dad and mom. Dad and mom come to David. Listen, there is nothing like family when you are going through a tough time. There is nothing like family coming and supporting you and, and, and coming by your side when you're going through difficult times, whatever happening in your life. I, I know I appreciate so much my brother, my dad, my mom, my stepdad. I just, I appreciate the family that comes to encourage me. And that's what happens with David. Then we read, right? So his brothers come, his mom and dad come. And then verse two, verse two. And I call this, I don't, I don't know if the NIV did this on purpose. I actually didn't look at other versions to see if it does it in other versions. But in the NIV, the, the way it's written in Hebrew is, is kind of like, um, oh, I don't know, a play on words. So in the NIV, they make it three Ds. A whole bunch of other guys, 400 of them come. But we're told in verse 2 that they're one of the three Ds. They're men who are in distress or in debt or discontented. Did everyone see that? The three Ds. So distress can mean men come because they're stressed out physically. Maybe they're ill. Maybe they're sick. Maybe they're physically down. Or maybe it means they're emotionally stressed out and distressed. Or maybe it means they're spiritually in pain or distress. Or it could mean that they have the stress of life or they're in grief. That word describes, can describe a lot of men. But these men are coming and for whatever reason, the stress of life is too much. The stress of what they're going through. And they come to David. Then people come to David who are in debt who are in financial bondage, who haven't been able to dig out the hole, or every time they get a job, they lose a job, and they can never get ahead, and, and they're in debt somewhat. Oh, by the way, people that are in distress come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. If you're going through emotional distress, spiritual distress, physical distress, Grieving distress, whatever distress, go to Jesus. Debt, the debt of sin, financial headaches, whatever, go to Jesus. And then the third group was the discontented. The discontented. You know, it reminds me, I, I have gone through this phase and this is a phase that, that God eventually drives everyone to. It's, it's what's talked about in the book of Ecclesiastes by Solomon. Solomon is trying to find happiness in life. And so first he kind of think, I, I think money is, is the key to happiness. So he gets all this money, gold, silver, and then Solomon goes, oh, that's not the key to happiness. It's vanity. I, I thought money would make me happy, and it doesn't. So I'm going to try pleasure. I'm going to have a lot of fun. I'm going to have women, parties. I'm going to try. And then after so long, Solomon goes, this isn't making me happy either. By the way, you just know the world out there, every college student, every adult, they go through these phases. Then Solomon says, I'm going to put myself into work. And he builds magnificent structures and, and it creates all these things. He's like, wow, what he does. And, and then he goes, yeah, that's, that's not making me happy either. I'm not feeling that inner fulfillment, that, that joy I'm looking for. Then he tries learning. I'm going to read. I'm going to study. I'm going to read encyclopedias. I'm going to read about the history. I'm going to study all kinds of things. But eventually he realizes this is all vanity, vanity. And then the conclusion is... It's God. It is God. All those men, they finally, they tried all those things and they discover it's God. It's where God's moving. And they come to David. Now, you and I might say, 
The losers come to David in the cave. They're all losers too. They're all running to the man cave. David's a loser. He lost everything, and he ran off to the cave, and now all these men are like, so here's, here's an interesting question, and it's a question all those in ministry, if you're in any kind of ministry, um, as a pastor or leading a Bible study or some kind of ministry, and here's the question you ask, why did you send me these people? Why did you send me these people? Robin and I were planting, and we've, we literally have experienced this many times. So I planted two churches, Robin and I together. We, we plant these two churches with, you know, these small core groups. And then when it's in the district, I planted, I helped pastors plant eight churches. But every time it happened the same way. So we would plant a church, and I would pray to God. I would say, God, bring me strong financially gifted, strong spiritual leaders. Bring me those type of men and women into our church plant. You know, men and women that can teach Sunday school, that will be good elders, that will be strong Christians that I don't have to babysit them or, you know, to, to plant this new church. And guess who God would bring me? <laughs> Families would come or individuals, and I would go, oh, man, they have more problems than, you know, I could share. I, I, I would be like to my wife, how, how are we going to build this church? I got a whole church. I, you know, the first 30, other than the core group, I had some good core groups, but the people that were coming in, I was like, oh, no one's even going to come to my church. If people come to my church and see who's in my church, they're going to go, we're not coming here. You got a bunch of, you know, crazy people. But let me, let me tell you something. Those are exactly the people that God brings because under the leadership of David and under the leadership of you in ministry, you're going to see the Holy Spirit transform those people into what are called mighty warriors. And Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 1.26. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. When you became a Christian, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. You read that whole thing. God loves taking great sinners and, and, and weakness, and God loves transforming them because he gets the praise and glory. And that's when I would watch God transform these people. So when you're in ministry and you have a Sunday school class and you go, well, why did I get these students? God's going to use you to transform these men and women, these teenagers, into mighty warriors for Jesus. So let me share some of these mighty warriors with you that joined David. They were the three D's. They were in debt. They were discontent. They were, you know, they were the losers. So come with me to 1 Chronicles 12. 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Don't lose, you know, 1 Samuel 22. But come to 1 Chronicles 12. And let's read about some of these warriors, some of these men that were transformed, and I'm sure the women and children were as well. So 1 Chronicles chapter 12. And it's interesting because we're going to talk about battling here, Israel battling against the Philistines. And it's like, hmm, what's going on today? But by the way, I know, and I pray for the peace of Israel, but you understand, I also pray for the peace of the Palestinians and, and all of the rest of people in our country. So I, you know God loves the whole world too, and there's a lot of, I get it, there's a lot of hatred, there's a lot of anguish, and I know what the answer is. I know what the answer is to Israel. I know what the answer is to Palestine. I know what the answer is to North Korea. I know what the answer is for Iran. I know what the answer is for Russia. You know what the answer is? Jesus, yeah. 
All right, chapter 12, verse 1. These were the men who came to David at Ziglag when he was banished from the presence of Saul, son of Kish. They were among the warriors who helped him in battle. They were armed with bows and were able to shoot arrows or to sling stones right-handed or left-handed. We think David trains them. David's at this cave. It could look like for years. He's training these losers that come to him. He's training them and they now can do slingshots with their right hand and, and their left hand and they become great warriors. And, and what's interesting is some of these men were relatives of Saul. From the tribe of Benjamin. I find that interesting. So even Saul's own relatives are like, hey, wait a second. Something is going wacko with this leader. Um, we see the anointing on David. We know he's from another tribe, the tribe of Judah. But, you know, we're defecting. We're going over to David. Verse 8. Some Gadites defected to David at his stronghold. And you'll see the stronghold and the cave are one in the same place. They went to his stronghold in the wilderness. They were brave warriors ready for battle and able to handle the shield and spear. Their faces, it's interesting, they come in distress. They come scared in debt. But David transforms them that their faces were like the faces of lions. And they were as swift. When you're depressed... Uh, you can't move. You can't get up out of bed. You can't, you know. But once the spirit moves on you, they were as swift as gazelles in the mountains. Verse 14. These Gadites were army commanders. The least was a match for a hundred. And the greatest for a thousand. It was they who crossed the Jordan in the first month when it was overflowing all its banks. And they put to flight everyone living in the valleys to the east and to the west. Other Benjamites and some men from Judah also came to David in his stronghold. This is interesting. Listen to this. So these 400 men would show up. David's like, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't just join me in the cave. I don't know who you are. I don't know if you're a spy for Saul. We're going to have a little interview first before you join me in the cave. So David goes, verse 17, David went out to meet them. And he said to them, if you have come to me in peace to help me, I'm ready for you to join me. But if you've come to betray me to my enemies, when my hands are free from violence, David says, I don't, you'll say David always fights the enemy, the Philistines. He never fights innocent people and he doesn't even fight King Saul. When my hands are free from violence, may the God of our ancestors see it and judge you. Then the spirit came on Amasai, chief of the 30, and he said, we are yours, David. We are with you, son of Jesse. Success, success to you and success to those who help you for your God will help you. So David received them and made them leaders of his raiding bands. I love that. Look, if you're coming to Jesus, are you coming to Jesus to join him, to be part of the army of the living God? Or are you coming to cause trouble for Jesus and his church? May God ever so judge you if you are a tear and a spy for the enemy in the church of God. And just like these men, success, success to you, success to everyone who helps you, so too, Jesus, success to you, Lord Jesus, success to the church, and success to every believer who takes up the word of God, the sword of the spirit on behalf of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. I realize we aren't fighting flesh and blood. We're in spiritual warfare. Second Samuel 23. Second Samuel 23. So come back to second Samuel and find chapter 23. Some more about these mighty men that are transformed under David's leadership. Second Samuel chapter 23, verse eight. 
I got to get my spear. These are the names of David's mighty warriors. Josheb, Bashabeth, a Tekamanite, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. Can you imagine one guy shish kebabs 800 others? Our church holds about 300, so triple our church, fill every chair, and have one person. Okay, who's going to get shish kebab first? I'm going to do two or three at a time. Wow. Nine, verse nine. Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dodai, the Ahohite. As one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pastamen for battle. Then the Israelites retreated. They all ran away. But Eleazar stood his ground, and he struck down the Philistines till his hand grew tired and froze to the sword. So, and then they all come back. The Lord brought about a great victory that day. The troops returned to Eleazar, but only to strip the dead. And they come up to Eleazar and like, I can't let go of the sword. It's frozen to it. I mean, they had to soak it in hot water and, and help them ease each finger off of the sword. Next to him, verse 11, was Shema, son of Agi, the Herite. When the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils. I think this is interesting. What are lentils? Beans, yeah. It's interesting that God puts this little detail in that this battle is going to take place in a bowl of beans. Israel troops fled from them, but Shema took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. So I made some bean soup that day. Whoops. Next to him, all right, let me, verse 13. During harvest time, three of the 30 chief warriors came down to David at the, where? The cave of Adullam, while a band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephem. At that time, David was in the stronghold. The stronghold and the cave of Adullam are the same place. And the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. The Philistines, and Bethlehem, you remember, is David's hometown. And David, in verse, he's in the cave, in the stronghold, and verse 15, he's just kind of, kind of talking to himself, and he goes, ah, oh, if only I had water from, from a special place. Oh, that someone would get me a drink of water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, because that's where he grew up, and he's like, oh, that water's so delicious, oh, you know. So the three mighty, verse 16, the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well near the gate of Bethlehem, and carried it back to David. But he refused to drink it and said, he poured it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives, and David would not drink it? Such were the exploits of three of the three mighty warriors. Now listen to this. So you got these three mighty warriors, then suddenly you get... A fourth guy, Abishai, the brother of Joab, son of Zorah, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 300 men whom he killed. And so he became as famous as the three. Was he not held in greater honor than the three? And he became their commander, even though he was not included among them. It's, it's kind of funny. It's like God's like, these are three mighty warriors. But this guy's just as great too. There's another mighty warrior. And here's another mighty warrior. Verse 20. Benai, son of Johada, a violent fighter from Gab Gabzil, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day, and he killed a lion. That's when you battle Satan face to face. And he struck down a huge Egyptian. Although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benai went against him with a little club. But he snatched the spear from that Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benaiah, son of Jehoadad. He too was as famous as the three mighty warriors. He was held in greater honor than any of the 30, but he was not included among the, the, thir the three. <sighs> so, what happened to my clicker? Can you click ahead <laughs> for me? I was thinking of the mighty warriors of today. Yeah. Mighty warrior of that day, 
struck down, you know, 800 of the enemy, 500 of the enemy. Upward, in that ministry, hundreds and hundreds of kids have come to the Lord. That's amazing. There's mighty warriors working in that ministry, leading hundreds of kids to the Lord. We don't even know what happens. They move out, they grow up. Some of them are married, and, and they trace that their beginning of their salvation was back here at Life Point Alliance. Children's ministry, Bible studies, giving the missions. You know, this church does amazing. Probably thousands have come to the Lord in other countries. Thousands have been led to the Lord who then go and lead thousands of other people to the Lord and on and on it goes. Wait till we see the reward. Leading people to give their hearts to Jesus. Leading people in the worship of God. The odd jobbers, the trustees working on the Lord's house. The number one reason people visit our church is because of seeing the house of God. The staff, amazing staff in this church. Leadership. The prayer warriors of the church. The Lord using you in your place of where you live and where you work and your schooling. This is just some examples of mighty warriors that God has raised you up. I know for me, I was like a nobody. I, and, 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 you know, Jesus moved in my life. Oh, by the way, let me tell you about one more mighty warrior. Verse 39, and Uriah the Hittite. Uriah the Hittite. He wasn't even an Israelite. This guy shows up at the cave, and David goes out and says, who are you? And he goes, I'm Uriah. I'm from another country. David says, no. I have believers in here, the righteous. Uriah goes, I'm going to follow your God. I believe God has led me to give my heart to the Lord, and I want to follow you as my leader. Success, success to you, success to everyone who follows you. I see God moving. And David says, okay. God's open to people from other nations coming to the Lord. You can join me, Uriah. And Uriah says, yes, and, I, and I, brought my, I, I brought my new wife. Her name's Bathsheba. She's, she's with me. She's joining me. And David says, oh, that's great. And, you know, Uriah, I just sense we're going to become good friends. Someday when I'm king in Jerusalem, I hope you live in a house nearby me. Oh, wait a second. Maybe I'm... Um, laying a foundation for a sermon that might come in the future. So come back to Second Samuel, or First Samuel 22 again. We got to close. Oh yeah, we definitely got to close. So he's in his cave, verse five. But the prophet Gads, the prophet comes to David in his stronghold, in his cave. And the prophet says to David, do not stay in the cave, in the stronghold. Don't stay there. You need to move out and you need to go to the land of Judah. Do you know what Judah means? Leah gave her fourth son the name Judah in Genesis, I think it's the last verse of chapter 39. Do you know what Judah means? It means praise. And it's interesting that in Psalm 142.7, David prays to the Lord, set me free from my prison that I may praise your name. So the prophet comes to David and says, you know what? Listen, men, women, we get into our man caves, our she sheds. We're crying out to the Lord. But at some point, the Lord comes and says, it's time to get out of your cave. It's time to get out of the she shed. God's got wonderful things for you to do. You need to go to the forest. I got a picture here. I, I just, I like this. Get out of the cave, David. Head back to Judah. Head back to praise. And head back to the forest, which is the blessings for us, as opposed to living in a cave where there is no growth, there is no fruit. There's go to the forest of Judah and 
God is going to move now in your life. The training of your 400 warriors, the mighty men, you're ready to go and to do amazing things for the Lord. So get out of the cave. Get out of the stronghold and move out into the world, mighty warriors, and tell people about Jesus. Don't be hiding. Just go out, start praising the Lord, giving thanks to the Lord, and do battle for the souls of men and women for Jesus Christ. So I, grab your hymn book. You need to use your hymn book. And if I can have some of the worship team, though, I'm, I'm going to lead, but if some of the singers could come up, and where is the next hymn? Because I don't have the number. 530. 530. So I want you to see this hymn. It's, it's a hymn. My wife goes, and it's very rare that she ever says this to me. She says, I've never sung this hymn. So musicians, you've been practicing it. Pastor Paul, grab a mic and... The reason I, that the Lord led me to this hymn, though I've never, is look at what it says. I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one. Lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was. This reminds me of the guys that came, the three Ds. I was weary and worn and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. It just reminded me of the men coming to David at the cave for refuge and rest. And, and it's true for all of us as well. So let's... Let's go ahead and let's sanctuary is the cave of Adullam. We've all met in the stronghold. But the prophet says you need to leave the cave. It's been nice to get together. Family, David's family's all there. We're all, you know, many, we're family, we're brothers and sisters. But now you need to go out. And you need to go to the place of praise and worship and go to the forest of God's blessing where he's going to use you to have fruit for the Lord Jesus. Father, fill us with your spirit. Dismiss us with your blessing. Go with us as we leave the stronghold of being in your presence. And we go out. In your name we pray. Amen.